Okay, now we're back to post audio. Uh, this is probably the, the least uh, important one, but it's something to know nonetheless. When you finish your edit, hopefully you have picture lock, hopefully you have picture lock before you send it to post audio, but post audio is gonna need some copies. They're gonna need uh, uh, the OMF and AAF, which I'm sure all of you know how to do that, but they also need a, a, a file to copy, uh, to chase, a QuickTime file to chase. And uh, hopefully they'll give you a list of deliverables. Usually it's a ProRes file, but there are some people in, the, in town who are still using older versions of Pro Tools on older CPUs and they can't chomp through ProRes files. So they may want a DV file. They may want a DVC Pro HD file. So you have to be able to create these files so that it really pays at that point to sync up with your post audio facility and say, hey, what do you want? Uh, of course, we have automatic duck on there because of the uh, bottle openers, of course. Um, ProRes DNX HD and of course DVD MPEG-2. A lot of uh, audio facilities don't want to bother with you. They just want the OMF or AAF and they want a DVD and then they will rip it the way they want. Cool. Uh, and you'll need it for a majority of places. If it's a larger budget film, you'll have the editors, the sound editors will need a copy. The dub stage will need a high res copy because the producers and directors are coming in and watching it on a big screen. They want a pristine copy. We have the uh, 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 Foley walkers. They need a copy and they need the time code window burn put elsewhere. Because you put the time code window burn where? Usually at the bottom of the window? How do you do Foley to that when you have time code window over where the feet are? So that's another copy you have to generate. Thank you. Um, uh, there's also a, a concept called forensic watermarking. Um, and that's actually being able to encode video with a hidden watermark that if it ever leaks out, despite any kind of other compression, you can take that file and analyze it and track it down to who got it. All right. Uh, applications like Sorensen Squeeze. Anyone here use Sorensen Squeeze? Okay. Some dub stages prefer Sorensen Squeeze, although not a lot of people use it because it has a hidden talent. You can actually lock a video file. You can encode a video file with a pass key, and so when a dub stage gets it, they have to enter in that pass key. So it's one more level of security. So lastly, we have the deliverables. And this, unfortunately, is going to be uh, a Charlie Foxtrot, I think is the PC way of saying it, um, because there are just a, a ton of formats. There are a ton of mobile devices. There are a ton of uh, standards. And this is where you make the money. Okay, I've uh, personally worked with two companies this year that have uh, made it a business model to do encoding for a living. That's all they do. You feed them a file, they deliver, they deliver everything. And it's these kind of formats. It's generating the three GPs, the H.264s for your Android, uh, for your iPhone, for any other mobile device. It's creating the Blu-rays as we talked about a few minutes ago. It's the MPEG-2 for DVDs. And then, and this is the kicker, since web video right now is making up more than half the internet traffic, Every outlet, whether it be Hulu, YouTube, Vimeo, they all have their own specifications. And what if you're sending it to a network? They have their own specifications. So now when you're generating this, you can charge per encode, right? Oh, you want to send this to NBC, Mr. Client? Okay, that's a, that's a la carte, you have to add that on. Oh, you want CBS too? Okay, they have different standards. And because you have the secret sauce, you know how to take those specs and translate that into your encoding application, that becomes a very valuable uh, uh, commodity. And uh, final thoughts, and I'm hoping I'm running good on time here, Mike. Yeah, I'm good? Cool. Okay. Um, on set, you have a lot of downtime while you're setting for the next scene, right? What's wrong with having the assistant editor, or in this case a DIT, on set, and I think I see some DIT people over there, to be on set to take those files and start encoding them on set. What's wrong with that Canon that you're shooting with, taking that H.264 and flipping that into ProRes or to DNX HD while you're waiting around on set? There's a position out there called DIT, Digital Intermediate Technician, and that's pretty much their job, is they're generating these files on set. So there's nothing preventing that from making your editorial life uh, easier. Um, you can use your old CPUs. As we know, Apple likes to phase out CPUs really quick. Stuff becomes antiquated pretty quick. And newer software really, uh, for any uh, computer, needs to have that kind of horsepower. So what's wrong with using the old CPUs to create a render farm 
or a bunch of computers talking together to distribute encode amongst multiple computers. In fact, I don't know if any of you know this, you know, compressor, you can actually do that. You can set up compressor uh, nodes among all your machines, have them talk to one another, and chop through a file quicker. So there's nothing wrong with repurposing your old machines to do that, squeak a little bit more life out of those machines. I think we've also gotten out of the habit of uh, we can't deal with real time. Real time is too slow. One hour of uh, one hour footage, one hour of encode, that's too long. And I think when we start trying to work in the digital realm and saying I'm just going to encode this, we're, we, we get accustomed to I, ca I can't go analog. I can't lay it off the tape and recapture. I, I lose quality. There is nothing wrong with playing something out of your avatar final cut and then capturing it into another system in real time and encoding it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's actually no must, no fuss. If you think about it, right? Play, record for the encode, done. One hour is one hour. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that gets overlooked. Uh, is anyone here familiar with the concept of a QuickTime reference? Very cool tool. You know when you're in Final Cut uh, and you uh, export a file uh, to, to an encode, typically you have to wait for the uh, whole file to encode into a brand new file or a self-contained file. You don't have to do that. You can export a pointer, and that pointer is a reference, and that reference points to all the media sitting on your drive. So then you use that reference as the encode point for compressor or for Telestream, uh, and so that will alleviate some of your encode time uh, tying up your Final Cut system or your Avid system. There are a couple other products that I'm a big fan of. As I mentioned, Telestream, I'm a fanboy. I should get commissioned as much as I push them. Uh, but there's another company out there called Digital Rapids. Those of you who are gearheads will love Digital Rapids because an engineer built it and it operates like an engineer. Uh, Inlet is another company. Cisco just bought them, so they have a lot of financial backing. Uh, Sorensen Squeeze, as I talked about, and I think some of you already use. Uh, another cool product is Root6. Uh, they make a product called Content Agent. How many here have done node-based finishing or compositing? Right? So you're familiar with the uh, you know, main clip and you apply a color grade and then apply this filter and it's kind of a workflow. Root 6 actually has a great workflow builder where you can create an encode and then send an email when it's done, then upload it, check to see if the person got the email and then re-encode it if they don't like it. So it's this you can construct a workflow, very cool. And then another product uh, is Rosette and that's another encoder kind of like Digital Rapids. So. That's it for encoding. Uh, any questions? I went through a lot of stuff.